All right, we're going to do a little talking about what's causing the issue we're having with our weather and why these fires are happening. But all I, I just want to tell you, the only thing I can do to, to be of any assistance whatsoever is to say clean your gutters. If you have gutters around your house, clean, make sure, because that if embers get in there and then it gets up under the eaves, that's that's what will burn, and boom, now you got trouble. Now the other thing, I'm, I'm ready a little bit. Uh, I have gutters, obviously. I, I'm going to clean mine if the, anything happens, but they're not clean now. <laughs> now, I also have a soaker hose, a couple of them, which I could run right across my ridge line and attach it to my water because I have a well. Now, I was talking with Tyson about this. He, he's, he, he won't have any electricity now to run the, the pump, to run the well, to all of that stuff. Now, I have a generator and uh, I'm not sure if he does or not, but, but he was talking about, well, people won't have electricity and so forth. If you had a generator and you could run your well, if you had a well, somehow if you could get a soaker hose going and get it into those gutters, and then for me, I would go up and drill a hole into the gutters here, bing, 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 right down the line, so that it, the water, when it ran into the gutter, plug up the drain and let it drain against the the side of the house and run down and you can almost like put water around your house and it sort of keep your house wet if you you know if you, that's all I can say it's the only thing I can think of that could help anybody that has a house exposed above ground in these raging firestorms because there's so many particles flying and something's going to land on there sooner or later probably and like Tyson's got all kind of huge trees right around his house and I, I'm, I got an acre or so cut around with nothing but that's the only thing I can recommend now let's talk about the situation all right, this is, uh, I'm just terrible, I'm horrified to be perfectly honest with you, and I am praying for Tyson, my very good friend up in Oregon. They are in the midst of some terrible fires up there, and uh, at this moment he's safe, and I'm just praying that he stays safe. This is happening right now in California, Washington State, um, Oregon, all that, the whole area, and it's not going to get a lot better a lot quicker. It's, it's not going to get, like I say, the most important thing is to be perfectly honest, and it's not going to get better. It, we, the earth is overheated, and there's no way to release this heat that I can t t determine. Now, the only possible way of mitigating it to some degree is to be able to get away from using combustion like this to burn for you know fossil fuels and so forth because that is what we know that we know this was causing a global climate change because it pressurizes and and adds electrons to the atmosphere electrons are heat electrons are energy anytime you burn anything this is adding bazillions of electrons so it's it's like fuel to the fire of the fire it's not good at all and i'm going to show you exactly how electrons flood into other atoms and how cold works by pulling the electrons out of it and we are scrubbing through the atmosphere of space which is loaded with electrons which are in molecules called photons primarily coming from the sun we scrub our atmosphere against that creates a huge number of electrons they call it the ionosphere the magnetosphere the trophosphere all out there is scrubbed particles heat thousands of degrees out there because it's scrubbing and that heat works its way down now it's not it, the heat doesn't just leave the earth it keeps scrubbing it in so we're not going to probably be able to get rid of a lot of heat we should have tried you know it's kind of late now in the game and like i say i'm being perfectly honest with you i'm not going to sugarcoat anything but i right away you could do this tomorrow you could have hydrogen and oxygen being converted through a venturi and you could literally convert the engines that are in these vehicles right now to run on that hydrogen oxygen mixture because it's nothing more than a combustive mixture if you make it combustion instead of electricity because when you when you fuse hydrogen and oxygen together you it's literally electricity and the byproduct is water h2o now when you combust hydrocarbons 
you have a different situation. You, you end up with CO2 and so forth. But you've got to get rid of the carbon. The carbon holds the hydrogens. In water, it's the hydrogen and the oxygens. That's all it is. And then, through a venturi, you can recombine it into the engine and, and burn it just like you would burn a um, hydrocarbon. Right? Only this is a hydrooxygen. Now, I'm going to show you the details of how electron flood theory works, why this is happening, how the atmosphere interacts with our ionosphere, and even the Schumann layers are shaking frequencies because each layer charges up at a certain amount after it scrubs a certain way and discharges. That's the lightning discharge. That creates the pulse every 7.83 hertz. Boom, 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 scrub. Boom, scrub, boom, scrub, boom. And that is what forces all the electrons on Earth to pulsate. And I'm going to explain it. Schumann frequency drives the motion of electrons inside of atoms. It's all making sense now. Okay, I'm going to just leave it at this. Once again, electron flood theory, I've shown it a million times, a pulse red laser accelerates to go through a venturi which is rounded slot where they force all the particles to concuss with each other. The weak force walks away and it comes back in later. The strong force concusses. An electron literally looks like this. It has a positive and a negative side. The positive side has no energy whatsoever. It is just an attractor of other particles. And it doesn't mind being against each other. The explosive side, the electron part, the explosive part, is, is very, very explosive and concussive. When they're together in a configuration like this, they are light, they bounce off of things. When they are like this in an electron configuration, they incorporate in, they burn things, they fuse in. They'll migrate in if there's not too many, but if there's a whole batch of them come at once, they explode what they enter. That's why people talk about um, the mud fossilization and then they say, oh, maybe that thing got hit by lightning or something caused it. No. Anytime you have excessive current flowing through anything, it excites, expands, explodes, destroys. It does not preserve. No way in the world will it do that. This is from flood, and this is what happens is these things get in salty waters that aren't terribly salty, and they soak for an extended period of time. Nucleophilic invasion takes over, and it, it, it replaces the molecules until they get semi-stable. Then it dries out and gets flushed with clear, clean water. Salts and things get out of there, and they end up being perfect copies of the original biological part and they separate on these lines of fascia which is that's a fabric and they all have all right so that's the story there now I would like to work with someone I would certainly like to have some interaction with somebody that can get something accomplished I'm coming up with all these things I'm talking about all these things but I'm getting nobody to respond back to me and I'm trying to get a hold of people that you know Fermi Lab and all of these different places I'm sending them the stuff and sending them the information send them the pictures send them the, you know how this is done and what I think electron flood theory does which is it says that there's nothing but electrons and the electrons are dipoles and the positive part of the electron literally can separate from the negative part of the electron and flood to the core and they, they apparently are just separate particles and they, they're the strong and weak force and normally they're together but when they concuss they explode when they go into formation from being light and electricity into being molecules, they congeal into certain resonant stable frequencies. And I believe they re relate to the Schumann frequencies, and that's what keeps everything shaken inside of electrons, inside of molecules and atoms. I always wondered how come they keep 
why are they always active? What, what's keeping them active? It's the Schumann frequencies. And there is seven of them, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if you look at the layers of atmosphere around the Earth, there is also seven Schumann frequencies around the layers of the atmosphere. Not an accident. And the heartbeat works on the lowest Schumann frequency, which is 7.83 hertz, identical to what the human heartbeat works on. That's the first human frequency. Then they go up 6.5 hertz from there, up, 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 up. And those are the different layers of atmosphere. Some of them collect where they, you get lightning. Some of them, you, now they're seeing sprites because there's too much interaction of electrons in these regions of space. The ionosphere, the magnetosphere, the trophosphere, all that stuff, stratosphere. Those are different layers of atmosphere. That's all it is. And the reason is because we're scrubbing through the outer layers of, we're scrubbing through dense particles that are coming out of the sun. I mean, it's just obvious. And it, until they can stop and say, look, look we got to stop and think this thing over about Einstein again and Bohr and all that, because it's, it's all wrong. It's just absolutely 100% wrong. No question whatsoever. If I can debate somebody, I will debate them and I will show them and I can, show, well, I'll show you right now. All right, electron flood theory, red pulse laser. It looks like a wave. It's actually a particle, and that particle comes forward as a wave because this is what concusses, not the particle. If you can make it accelerate, which we did, it will pull the particle out of the wave and become seen, and it will look like this, a photon. And then it will separate as it comes through the venturi, and the, only the explosive part will stay, and there it is right there. Now, here's the wave, and it's actually only a particle way back here, and each one of these is a particle, 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 and boop, 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 and here it is accelerating, and when it accelerates, it the actual particle pulls itself out of the wave. You can see it's pulling itself from the acceleration. When it hits the venturi, the, there's a black portion and a white portion. I have one around here somewhere. Here it is right here. This is what it looks like as it hits the venturi. Then the black and the white separate, and here's what it looks like when it hits the venturi. It's right here. You see it? The black and the white separate. The black is weak, and it's just a, like a, an attractive force. It's just, it doesn't really interact. The white explodes like an atomic bomb, and, and it creates these electron showers. The black one just rolls away and does nothing. And by the way, this is exactly what they're looking for, to, for the bosons and fermions or muons, muon neutrinos versus electron neutrinos, electron showers. They come in like this. The black part walks away from the white part. The white part explodes a very concussive. The black part rolls around and comes back in here. The black parts don't mind being even on top of each other or being very close to each other. They have no effect on each other. They are willing to snuggle up to each other. These are not. The only way these will come close to each other is if they're attached to a, a, a black one. And then they will go back and forth like a, a photon. And that's what this is right here. And that, we saw this just before this. Now, if you could separate these two, and you can, and that becomes electricity. And so is that. These are electrons. Back-to-back -back electrons makes this basically a neutral photon. Instead of incorporating into other matter, it bounces off. And it depends on what the other matter is, and how it can move, and what its flexibility is, is how, how hard it pushes back, whether it's red or green or blue or purple or whatever color it comes back as. And that is only frequency. And frequency is nothing more... Hold on, I got it here somewhere. Well, maybe I don't. Frequency is nothing more than the spin, how fast something spins. Oh. How quickly things get lost. Anyway, that's the, that's the case. The faster it spins is the faster the frequency, the more impact it has the richer the color. You know, it goes from red all the, down to the other direction. Um, red is the longest frequency. And then you get green and blue and so forth and violet, and, which is a much faster spin. And that's all you're looking at is spin. You're not looking at a flappy wave of something going like this. You're looking at a particle going zzzz like that. Now, I am going to claim also, not only can we separate 
the weak force from the strong force, I believe if we were sending this as high pressure water, H2O, we could literally, depending upon the way we constructed the venturi and the uh, type of material we use, we could literally disassociate the oxygen from the hydrogen and just collect the hydrogen right here. And then we could go, obviously refuse it into the oxygen, so your hydrogen fusion really, back into the oxygen together. The end product is water and when they go back together they create raw electricity, 1837 electrons for every hydrogen and there's two hydrogens for every oxygen. A lot of power there and if you did it right you could create Brown's gas and Brown's gas is not only hydrogen and oxygen it's hydrogen on steroids it's hydrogen instead of hold on one second all right this is just a quick explanation of Brown's gas the the negative part the positive particles go to the center which and they collect together they don't have any, no problem being next to each other so the negative particles surround them in the outside 1837 approximately is a hydrogen hydrogen one but then there's hydrogen two there's hydrogen three and you can if you force more electrons in there because of electron thud flood there's a bazillion different little particles there. There's not just one big proton. It never worked and it doesn't work. It's all electrons. I could force, instead of 1837, I might be able to put 1875 in there, or 1900, or 3000. But you can go, they go 1837 at a time, hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, hydrogen 3. And then I got a whole bunch of ones in between that are isotopes that aren't quite this and aren't quite that, a little less, a little more. That's why they are all these particles. Sometimes you don't have to have every single one of them in there. Sometimes you have a couple of extra. That's what these isotopes are. It's time they start to listen to electron flood theory. It's the only thing that makes you know any sense. And when you get all these extra electrons forced in, the nucleus, you, you know, you, you you not only force them into the orbitals, you force them literally into the nucleus. So the nucleus, instead of being 1837, might be 1860. And when you put that into the oxygen, boom, you got all kinds of release of electrons. And that's all it is, because every time you do almost anything, it's the hydrogen you're using. Because the hydrogen is the smallest little package of electrons. It's almost always using hydrogen.